I am really excited for our webinar today. I've had the amazing journey working with collective impact, asset-based community development, and results-based accountability, and putting them together to help my community to develop a healthy communities plan. A few months ago, I came across Dan Duncan's article, The Four Components of Effective Collective Impact Through the Lens of Asset-Based Community Development and Results-Based Accountability. I thought, wow, I wish I had this 15 years ago. I called Dan up and asked if he would share his learnings on a webinar, and here we are today. So get out your pens and get out your paper, as we're going to learn how these frameworks and approaches can work together to change the way we do our community work. I'd like to welcome Dan Duncan on the webinar today. Dan is currently a senior consultant at Clear, Imp Clear Impact. Dan brings a wealth of results-based accountability, RBA, and asset-based community development, ABCD, and collective imp impact experience to his work across the USA. He uses his extensive experience to help clients and communities achieve even greater community level results. Welcome Dan, and over to you. All right, thank you very much. It is a pleasure to be here and to join everyone today. <clears throat> so this, is, this webinar is based on uh, my experiences. I've spent about 40 years or so uh, in this space, many years, about 30 years as a United Way professional. So use this in a lot of different uh, opportunities. Apologize. So again, the uh, effective collective impact. It's, okay, you've already heard about me. And it's <clears throat> the article that uh, she, Heather was referencing is this one, and you can certainly uh, get that or download it. I think they've sent them to you already, but it's available on our Clear Impact website as well. So assumptions for creating community level change. Uh, based on my work, uh, first of all, collective impact requires a wide variety of strategies and data to know what's working. There's no one strategy, there's no one magic bullet. That's why collective impact came apart, came about. But it's also not just about better programs. It calls for changes in policies, institutions, and structures. And in some cases, better programs are the least important activity that we can do because just turning people into clients is not the best way to achieve community level change. And that's because real impact also requires the community and residents to be involved as what we call producers and co-producers of their own and their community's well-being. And that's one of the th key things we'll talk about today during the webinar. Also, communities have an abundance of resources, so we have to take an abundant mentality. The issue is that they've just not been identified and engaged. And just remembering, it is never just about money. It's about the community and the engagement. We also need to conduct our work through a racial equity lens so that we're seeing the true story and understanding the true, imp the true impact of our work that we do and the policies and pre procedures that we, uh, that we implement. So the conditions of collective impact, I think all of you have probably seen these five conditions by, um, that were highlighted by John and Mark. And to highlight that the, uh, these are not really new. These are, uh, they did a great job of getting this focused, but I like to remind people that uh, Lee Shore uh, had almost exactly the same five uh, conditions 20 years in, in the future, or 20 years earlier. Uh, be clear about the purpose of our work. What are the outcomes we're trying to achieve? Be willing to be held accountable for achieving those purposes is where data becomes important. Create and sustain the partnerships necessary. No one institution, organization can do it alone. Also, she also talked about move audaciously into the world beyond programs. And I think that is very critical as we, uh, as we move forward. And then finally, have the capacity to take community-wide responsibility to ensure what we're going to do actually happens, the backbone role. So effective collective impact, uh, really um, based on my experience, and I apologize, the slide got a little bit of out, of, uh, out of focus or out of scale, uh, really relies on a couple different things, I believe. Being very clear about the common purpose, community engagement and co-productions, relationships and trust, and shared accountability and results. But it's an RBA, results-based accountability and asset-based community development can help us do all of these things. And that's why I 
develop the paper and my work through uh, the lens of ABCD and RBA. But it must start on a foundation of equity and inclusion. This is the uh, definition from PolicyLink, an organization in, in Oakland that I think is really wonderful. It talks about the just and fair inclusion into a society in which we can all participate, prosper, and reach their full potential. And so as we begin to add equity into our work, it's not a separate principle or a separate add-on we do occasionally. We need to make a front-end commitment to furthering equity, to invite the disaggregation of data, always looking at the true story. And the story behind the data explores the systemic factors perpetuating inequity. And we have to make sure we're engaging community members so we truly understand the lived experiences. So one, just a quick example, if we look at data, we're looking at all, here's third grade reading, our result, all children succeed, school life and career, tracking third grade reading, we can see we're making slow progress, but at least we're making a little progress. But when you disaggregate the data so that you don't miss the true story, you find a very different story. So different strategies are needed to help uh, black and Hispanic kids versus the white and Asian kids, because the all is an average. So that's why it becomes so important that we're always looking through disaggregated data through the uh, equity lens as we do this work. The next one, common purpose. Common purpose is, should be based on the hopes and dreams of people we serve, not, and the people that live in the communities we serve, not just better programs or services. It requires authentic community engagement to identify those hopes and dreams, and it must be an integral component from the beginning. You can't just decide, this is what we're gonna do, now let's get the input. We need to engage the community from the beginning around this work. And RBA and uh, Mark Friedman's seven questions can help us do that. The first question is, what are the quality of life conditions we want for the children, adults, and families in our community? And what would these conditions look like if we could see them? So when I work with communities, what I often do is ask everybody to close your eyes, close your eyes and highlight if our collective impact effort is successful, how would our community be different 10 to 15 years from now, <clears throat> excuse me, if we are successful. And we have that discussion and people highlight, we see kids out playing in the, uh, in parks and in front yards and, and playing. Although one person said, we see kids playing after school, but they're not out on the streets during school. We see more people employed, we see better housing, et cetera. And so what I ask is it's very clear that those outcomes, what we just saw 10 to 15 years from now, do not come from better pro only from better programs and services, but it be those outcomes can only occur if the community and their residents are involved in that effort. So the next one, is partnerships and trust. So we have to be clear that there's real power if we can bring funders and organizations and government and community residents all together, working together, there's an incredible opportunity for that. But to do that, we have to be very clear in collective impact efforts that organizations do not partner together. XYZ agency doesn't work with the city, et cetera. People do within those organizations and people work together based on common purpose relationships and trust. So we have to build the time to build the trust and relationships that are necessary. And one way to do that is to develop a common language to better understand and trust. And I'll talk about that a little later in relation to RBA, because that helps us bring this common language together. And you also have to assume that when key people transition, assume that your partnership resets to zero and you have to start over building that trust. You can't assume once you've got an agency and an organization working together, it's always gonna be that way because when people change, you lose the trust, you have to start over, particularly when people of leadership leave an organization. So it's an ongoing process of relationship building. The next one, community engagement and co-production, asset-based community development. Why is this so important? Well, one of the ways I like to think about it is we often think of our work as, a, as hard work. We think of it as a marathon, 26.2 miles, 44.4 kilometers. It's a marathon. It's very hard and very long. And if the only people in the marathon are the professionals, the agency people, the government people, the school people, and the community is all waiting at the finish line 
for the professionals to come across the finish line and save us? Guess what? We've been waiting a long time and those professionals can't get all the way to the finish line alone. They take a wrong turn, they run out of energy, they lose a grant. Something happens along the way. So we have to change our model from a hard marathon because improving lives is hard, long work, but we have to change our model to a relay race where we're very purposely handing the baton to the people to do those things that they can do and handing it back to the, uh, the professionals to do those things that only they can do. And if we truly do that, if we turn it into a relay race, we have a better chance of getting across the finish line. So we should think as our, of our work always as a relay race. So the, uh, the work of ABCD, I think so many of you are probably very familiar with this work of Asset-Based Community Development Institute. Uh, the concept and the uh, initial book, Building Communities from the Inside Out, was written by John McKnight and Jody Kretzman, the founders of the ABCD Institute. And I've had the, uh, the honor and the pleasure to be a uh, faculty member of the Institute for more than 25 years. And so it literally has driven my work uh, with United Ways and other agencies and now as a consultant around how this work can be more effective. Because with ABCD, we clearly start with better, different questions. Not what do you need, but what can you contribute? And not what do we need, but what can we do with what we already have to get what we need? So we change our, uh, our attitude of how we engage people and do this work. And so just to make this easy, I've developed these ABCD principles of three. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the characteristics, the role of residents, the three questions, people, power, changed, and how we can do this through the concept of asset mapping. So it starts with asset-based, locally focused, and relationship-driven. And the six assets that John and Jody identified when they wrote the book, they literally went all over uh, North America and visited low-income neighborhoods to identify what was the difference between low-income neighborhoods that were struggling versus no, low-income neighborhoods that were doing better. And what they found was those, age, those neighborhoods that were doing better were focusing on what they already had as a starting point, and they weren't waiting for the agencies and others from the outside to solve their problems. And the six gifts they identified, or the six assets, were first of all, people's individual gifts, and we call it the gifts of the hand, head, and heart, the practical skills people have, the knowledge that they have, and their passion because people's passion is their motivation to act. And I'll talk about that later. They also highlighted the association life. Even in a low-income neighborhood, there is a large number of associations. And associations are where people come together collectively based on their passion. The largest example of that is where people go to pray. The congregation is a, a, an association. The church itself or the synagogue, mosque may be an institution, but the Congregation is an association, and we all know the power of those relationships. The third thing they identified is the institutions, but in the better focusing neighbor, focused neighborhoods, uh, the institutions, business, government, nonprofit, were helping the neighborhood by focusing on what they could do. The businesses were uh, hiring people from the neighborhood, investing their resources in the neighborhood. The government and nonprofits were doing what we call leading by stepping back creating space and supporting people to do those things they could already do to use the local assets. Then the physical space, vacant lot for a community garden or a vacant building for some strategy that the neighborhood could use, but the physical space. Using the, in fact, when I was working in, in Mesa, Arizona, they have good, good weather year round. This one neighborhood identified they had an issue with hunger. So what can they do with what they already have, they created a community garden, a year round community garden. They created six by six plots and everybody that had the interest, the passion for gardening and the skill and the development could grow uh, produce and they shared it among each other in the neighborhood. The uh, fifth ingredient is the time and money exchange, the economy, even in a low income neighborhood, if you organize the money, they the, it's there, you can organize the buying power to get the grocery store to provide better produce but also time, the barter system, uh, things like time banking and those things where people can barter effectively and share their gifts. And then finally, actually uh, the sixth one, which was added later from the initial book are the culture stories and history because that's what helps build the relationships 
that are so important. So why a focus on place-based work? The second part, why neighborhoods? First of all, it's where families and their children live. And so that's where we want to focus on and engage. So it's easier to engage them if they're there in their neighborhood. If somebody has to get in a car, they're not going to do as much than just going two, three doors down or a couple streets over. It's also for the, where the action is, both the good and the bad. And we know the more we can increase the good action, the bad action is going to decrease. Is also in an adage that the Annie Casey Foundation developed is to help kids succeed. They do better in strong families and families do better in supportive communities. So how could we can work on all of this, it makes more sense at a neighborhood or place-based level. It also helps us lead to the evidence-based side of this work, which is the more we can increase social capital, the positive connections between people in a community and collective efficacy, the belief and ability to accomplish things by focusing on the gifts and what they can do, we can in fact increase health and increase safety and other key issues. There's very clear evidence now that social capital is one of the largest ingredients of increasing health and longevity as we move forward. So focusing on social capital, building positive relationships goes beyond what we thought for many years. Because effective communities look inside first to solve problems, they don't wait for the outside. Relationships are seen as power. The people that have more relationships can connect more and have more power. They have a good sense of their assets and their capacities, not just their needs. Leaders open doors. Good leaders in this context are connectors, not dictators. It's not about being the leader, do it my way. It's about how do we connect everybody strategically to get things done that they want to do and they have the ability to do. And as we call it, citizens are involved. People take responsibility. Citizens in a neighborhood are people that are sharing their gifts and being part of the solution and taking responsibility. One of the other ways to think about it is the circles of care and responsibility. We have the individual in the middle, they're surrounded by their family and friends and their associations, which again, in most cases is where they pray. And then we have a new, new circle now, which is the internet, social media, communities of interest. That is there, people do connect that way. And then we have government and nonprofits as the outer edges. And what we've perfected over the years is government and nonprofits have jumped over all of those other rings to rescue the person in the middle as their client, as their student, as their patient. And the problem is, as we've jumped over all of those other rings, we've actually weakened those rings. So that's why it's important that effective strategies engage all of those rings. So when you develop a strategy, make sure you're connecting with the family, friends, neighbors, associations in the work. And if we do that, because those are the, all the rings that are there 24 seven. So if we focus on strengthening all of those rings, we can in fact build stronger neighborhoods and communities and achieve greater results. The next one, the three questions, being very purposeful about asking what can people do by themselves for themselves? What can people do with a little help from institutions? And what do residents need done that they can't do? And so if we focus on these questions, we can make sure that we are not doing things that people can do for themselves. For example, for the, according to the World Health Organization, the determinants of health start with personal behavior, social relationships, then the physical environment If people live next to toxic waste, they're gonna have more problems. Economic status, unfortunately, has a inverse correlation to healthcare and health, health outcomes. The least important, is access to healthcare. It's important and critical if somebody already has a disease or needs to uh, see a doctor, but if we're talking about creating health, there's much more on the side of social relationships and the role that people themselves can play. The next one, kids and making, helping make sure kids succeed. Kids are only in school 85% of the year, excuse me, 15% of the year. They're in their community, in their neighborhood, in their bed for some of it, but 85% of the time. So we have to stop thinking of the schools as the primary provider of education and learning. It needs to be a much more equal partnership so that we can in fact be more successful. So to help us do that as institutions, we can look very purposely of these, crest three, of these three questions and then add two new questions. 
Let's look at our current list of activities, our theory of change, all the things we're currently doing. And those things that we're currently doing, what can we stop doing to create space for resident action? What can we stop doing? And then the fifth one, what can we offer to the community beyond the services we do deliver to help them do what they can do themselves? Just a quick example. I was uh, working with a, an, a, an agency that just put in a, uh, a new uh, neighborhood center and they wanted to have a, an, an event to uh, celebrate that they were now in the neighborhood and invite the neighborhood to come to the neighborhood center. And so they were, I was at a meeting, they were talking about what caterer they were gonna hire to do this event. And I said, time out. I bet there are people in the neighborhood that know how to cook and more importantly, know how to throw parties. So what I would do is I would build relationships and talk to people in the neighborhood till you find the people in the neighborhood that want to put the party on for you to welcome you to the neighborhood and do it that way rather than um, taking the money out of the neighborhood, keeping the money and the energy in the neighborhood. So that's just a quick example of how we can, we can do that. So steps to lead by golden, excuse me, leading by stepping back, kind of three golden rules around that. Professionals should never do anything that people can do for themselves. And we should at times clearly resist the urge to be helpful, however well-meaning, if we're not asked for help. Quick story about that. I was working with a, a group in San Antonio and this one neighborhood group and the, uh, we invited neighborhood folks to come together on a Saturday morning to talk about what they could do themselves with their own gifts, find out what they could do, what activities they wanted to do collectively. And there was an agency in the neighborhood that was excited about this effort. They really were the best of meaning, best of intentions. So a couple of agency folks came to the meeting and when they came to the meeting, they were there and after about 20 minutes, one of the neighborhoods started to leave in the small groups. I said, where are you going? Why are you leaving? She said, I think I'm in the wrong meeting. Every time I suggested something, one of those professionals say, said something like, well, you know, that's a good idea, but we've tried that. And if you do it this way, it'll be more effective. Or the worst one, well, we've tried that and it won't work. So she felt totally deflated, totally in, disengaged in this process. So we really have to wait, let people learn from their own mistakes, learn and grow, and only provide help when asked. And finally, do not ask how we can involve people in our work. What we need to ask is how can we be involved with people in what they're already doing to help support and recognize and celebrate what they're all doing. So don't think of community engagement as about how do we get residents involved in our effort. Find out what they're doing and support that effort. And that's a, a lesson learned from uh, Mike Mather, who is a faculty member of the ABCD Institute, and he just wrote a new book that is wonderful that talks about how we can do this from a faith perspective. So I would really suggest do a Google search for Mike Mather, find his book and read it. Now the next one, the role of residents. If we think of the role of residents, there's three key roles. Um, at times people do need to be a patient, a client, a student, because there's something they need to know or something they need to learn, or they broke their leg. If I break my leg, I clearly want to go to the doctor, not to my neighbor to fix my leg. So there are things that professionals can do. But in this case, we know what we, you need. They're the professionals. They don't need to ask the questions because they're, they're in charge and they know what to do. And it's a very dependent relationship. You can't be a client, a patient, a student, unless you're led into that club. So that whole idea of eligibility and all of that gets in the way of true work. The second role is that people as advisors for institutional action. So at least we ask them, what do you need and how would you like it delivered? But it still typically drives institutional action. It's better because we've asked people, but it's still institutional action. And people sometimes think a lot of organizations, a lot of collective impact efforts thinks, think that's where community engagement stops in creating an advisory board of citizens to get their input. But that's clearly not where it stops. The third role of a producer and a co-producer of their own and their own and their community's well-being is where we ask that new question, what can you contribute as we do this work? And then our role becomes helping people, uh, our role becomes, excuse me, removing barriers so that people can in fact get engaged and 
um, share their gifts and become part of the solution. And I want to tell a quick story here. This is uh, the picture there is uh, Judith Snow. And Judith Snow um, was a, she passed away a number of years, unfortunately. She was an ABCD faculty member engaged in our work, but she was also, and she disabled. She was a paraplegic. She had no use of her arms and legs. And so she had to have 24 hour attendant care to care for her needs, to get her, do everything, uh, everything of, a, of living she had to have assistance doing. But she didn't view that, those people as filling in her emptiness. And she viewed it and they viewed it as their role was to remove barriers so that could she could share her gifts. Because as a leader in the disabilities field and movement in Canada, you knew, when you heard her talk, you knew that within five minutes she had more gifts to tell her stories and engage people than I ever will. In fact, I was telling the story once and one of my students in a class said, I've seen Judah speak and within five minutes, the wheelchair disappeared. And that's kind of the, uh, the effort. But one of the things she tried, decided to do the last couple of years of her life was to become an artist. So because she could move her head, she uh, strapped a laser light to her um, head, put the laser on the canvas, and one of her attendants followed the laser with the pen. And this is a self-portrait that she did using that strategy. So we need to be very clear, and this was for me as a social worker, I have an MSW, when I truly understand that the best work social workers and professionals can do is focusing on removing barriers so people can become part of the solution as co-producers, which was a much more effective role than filling in someone's emptiness. So what does engaging the community mean? It's not an opinion poll. It's not organizing the community to care about our agenda, your agenda. It's identifying what people care about and supporting their action. And along the way, we'll find people that are excited about what we're doing. We can, in fact, work with them on that effort. And how do you engage people to share their gifts? Focus on the gifts of their heart, those passions, what they truly care about, what drives them to get up at 7 a.m. on a Saturday morning to go do something. Because we often confuse this be, with volunteerism and volunteering. That's why I kind of hate that word because volunteering is typically recruiting people to do our to-do list. We, find, we identify five things we think people can do as volunteers. We recruit them and then we spend all our time trying to figure out how to motivate them to get them to show up more than once. Rather than finding out what they care about and asking them to do something around their passion and get out of their way. So one of the other ways to, to think about this work is in collective impact, we create our decision-making table. And in, a, in ABCD, we call this the geometry lesson. Professionals are triangles because an org chart fits in a triangle and residents are circles. So as you all see, when we typically create our first decision-making table, this is what it looks like. And we've got citizens on the outside or residents. And then we decide, well, maybe we ought to add a couple around the table. And typically the people we add around the table are people of color because we want somebody around that table to represent all of the uh, African-American women in the community or all the Hispanic males in the community. And that's not fair. And nobody ever asked me to represent all the Anglo males. So why do we put that unfair burden on somebody else? We just want their thoughts, their experiences. The other problem is it's a very unequal power dynamic because uh, the, uh, basically, the triangles are 12 feet tall, and the circles around the table are three feet tall. That's how it looks, that, un, that unequal power dynamic. The, tri the triangles talk in acronyms and a language that people don't understand, et cetera, et cetera. You know the story. So to be more effective, I found that what we want to do is create decision-making tables of citizens because they are perfectly capable of coming up with group decisions that can make a significant difference in their community. And we as triangles need to step back far enough so that we are on tap, not on top, and we're there if asked questions, but we don't jump in if we are not asked. So finally, asset mapping. How do we do this? We bring it all together by discovering, asking, and connecting. We need a process. And I've got a toolkit that you can download from our website that goes through these steps in detail. Um, but what you want to do is create an asset mapping team. It must be done by the residents themselves, can't be done by the outsiders, can't be done as a class project for your MSW. It's got to be done by the residents themselves. And it's about talking to people, listening to people, finding out what they care about, having what we call 
uh, learning conversations, not talking to people you don't know. So it's not about a survey. You really want to talk to people you already know. Because if I go knock on somebody's door and say, hi, I'm from the neighborhood. What are your gifts? What are people going to say to me? They're going to slam the door. So talk to the people you already know. Find out what they care about, their passion. Find out what skills they do. And then connect people with the same passion to act collectively. If you do that, you can begin this process. So we're, as we said, we're going to kind of keep going and let you ask questions as we go forward. So now I'm going to move to the next side, which is results and shared accountability. What is results-based accountability? So results-based accountability, it's a framework, a culture, and a process of data-driven decision-making. It's a way to help move from talk to action. It was developed by Mark Friedman. Mark was the head of finance for the uh, State of Maryland's Health Human Services Department. He was frustrated. Talk never got to action. People didn't use to sit data to make decisions. They just wrote wonderful, um, wonderful, beautiful plans that sat on shelves and never got implemented. So he developed RBA as a simple process. Doesn't necessarily make our work simple because we're dealing with tough, tough issues. That's why collective impact is so important but it does provide a framework to help us be more effective in the work we're doing. It's based on common sense, plain language, minimal paper, and it's the most important, it's useful. I first heard Mark speak, the first time he introduced RBA was in 1999 at a conference put on by the Annie Casey Foundation as part of their Making Connections Initiative. I was there, I heard him speak, and I, and I just, it just made so much sense, it was so, so focused that I literally, from that meeting, started implementing RBA at the United Ways that I was working at. And it made a huge difference in our work. So it's a disciplined way of thinking and taking action. So the basic concepts of RBA, again, we're just providing at this webinar kind of the high level. We're certainly uh, will ask questions and get deeper later um, or after this webinar. But it's based on two kinds of accountabilities, very, being very clear. Popula there's a difference between population accountability, everybody in the community, everybody in a neighborhood, and performance accountability, the people that we're actually working with in our programs, strategies, and activities. To help us do this, we need performance measures around the work we do, which tells us how much do we do, how well we do it, and is anyone better off? And then to use the data, we have five core questions to turn the curve. So whole populations, again, we can define that as the entire state, a community, a neighborhood. Performance accountability is about the customer cl or client population that we're working with. And in performance measures, how much did we do? How many people are we providing services to? How much are we providing? How well did we do it? You know, are, are we um, providing customer satisfaction, et cetera? But the most important one is, is anyone better off? Is what we're doing actually working? And the way we think about this in the performance metrics is this uh, matrix here of about quantity and quality, effort and effect. How much did we do? Tells us about how productive we are, the number of customers served, the number of activities provided. We need that for budgeting and planning um, and for writing a grant and getting, getting a grant, if you will. Because if we're gonna serve 200 people versus 2,000, we need different staffing, different buildings, different locations, whatever that may be, different amounts of funding. But also we want to make sure once we commit to something that we actually do it. Well, before RBA, before all of this, we used to fund agencies at the United Way and we wouldn't get, all we would get is the year end report from them in paper, you know, mail it to us or drop us, drop it off. We'd read it and say, well, you funded us to serve 200 kids, but we only served 150. It was too late, couldn't do anything about it. So I used to call those the oh well reports because we'd take that report, put it in a file folder and fund the agency again and tell them try harder next year. And that's why uh, Mark's book is called Trying Hard is Not Good Enough. Because if they were tracking during the year the number of kids that were in the program, they could have made mid-course corrections during the year to make sure by the end of the year they actually served 200 kids. The next one, quantity and quality. How well did we do it? Are we doing things right? Customer satisfaction, are we treating people well, give, well, giving them something of value? 
Are we following our protocols? Do we have the right people trained to do what we're doing? But then the most important one, I think, is retention rates. Did people stay in the program long enough to get the benefit of the program? Because it doesn't matter how good your program is if people don't stay in it long enough to get the benefit. And you can do things if you find, you know, it's a program for moms to teach them how to breastfeed and it's a five week program and you find out most of the moms are dropping out after two weeks, you might need to change the program to make sure in the location, the time, the food, the childcare, whatever that is, by purposely focusing on retention, you have a chance to improve the number of people that stay in the program long enough to get the benefit. And then finally, the most important, are we doing the right things? Is anyone better off? And every program, every activity we do, the goal of that program is des always designed to change skills, knowledge, attitude, opinion, behavior, circumstances, or conditions. And all of those are measurable through pre or post tests or observations or testing or whatever that may be, but we can do that. And if we track that, we can make mid-course corrections to make sure that more people are in fact better off in the work that we're doing. One of the things that we uh, did in uh, Tucson was when I was with the United Way there is that we uh, brought a, all the agencies that were working on after school programming. One of our results were all kids in safe places with caring adults after school. And we funded six agencies to provide after school programming. So we brought those six agencies together and asked them to identify what are the common performance measures that you're willing to collect individually and share collectively so we could see how the whole strategy is doing and we could create a learning cohort. So they came up with the number of kids served so we could track that. How well did we do it? They came up with kids that attended three or more sessions a week. They track that. And then finally, for is anyone better off, they decided they didn't want to just babysit. So they identified some key skills they wanted to teach all the kids in their after, ski, after school program. They developed a pre-post test so they would give kids the pre-test when they came in. And then every quarter they administered the post test, reported their results to us collectively, individually. We rolled it up collectively so we could say we served 4,362 kids the last quarter. 87% of them attended three or more sessions and 75% of the kids learned three or new skill, three or more new skills during the quarter. So we had results we could report to the community but more importantly, we created a learning community because we brought those six agencies together to share their results individually and learn from each other. So one agency could say, wow, you're having a better success at teaching that skill than we are. How are you doing it? What could we incorporate from your model and vice versa? Because we wanted to make sure we were creating learning cohorts or learning organizations and learning communities that could come together, use data to make data-driven decision-making to improve what we're doing. So to help use, use the information, to help us do turn, use data, we need what we call turn the curve thinking. And this is the process that we have for turn the curve thinking to help organizations use data to move from talk to action. To action. And so, but it starts with a key commitment to language discipline, as I mentioned earlier, because uh, we all have seen these words in our work. We have all of these words. We put them, one of the things, so we can talk about our measurable urgent systemic indicators. And one of the things that Mark likes to say, Mark Friedman, is that people, if people put three or more of these words together in a sentence, you can be clear they have no clue what they're talking about and no one will understand them. So one of the things that Mark decided we needed to do in RBA was bring a common set of terms, luckily only four of them, that we all have to agree and use so that we're clear what we're talking about as we work between partners and agencies and stakeholders and with the community, we know what we're talking about. So here they are. And for population accountability, there are two of them. The first one is a result, which is a condition of well-being for children, adults, families, or communities. Children born healthy, children ready for school, safe communities, clean environment. That's an example of a result statement in clear language everyone can understand. And then to tell us how we're doing in relation to that result, we need data. And data at the population level, we call an indicator to make it very clear there's a difference between 
population level data and performance or program level data. So an indicator is a measure which helps quantify the achievement of a result. So if we're talking about children born healthy, rate of low birth weight babies, children ready for school, percent ready at kindergarten entry, safe communities, crime rate are all examples of indicator level data. And then for performance accountability, we have programs, and what we mean by a program is a program, an agency, a strategy, or a service system. This is just a term we use that we all can agree. When we're doing work on the ground with customers, with clients, with students, with patients, what we're doing we call a program or, or an agent or a strategy. Because one of the things you can do is you can change these words as long as you all agree that these are the words we're going to use. So many organizations actually use the term strategy to um, instead of program, but you're free to decide that as long as you're clear that that's the term you're always using when you're relating to an agency, a nonprofit, the government, a foundation, but the work we're doing on the ground. And then we have performance measures, a measure of how well that program agency or service system is working when we're working with the people, the customers, the clients, and again, how well, which is the, is, is the middle one, how much did we do, and is anyone better off? So with those data for those three, we can make mid-course corrections to get more people into the program, to get people to stay in the program longer, or to increase our um, ability to get things done and get people in the program. But finally, the most important, is anyone better off? So turn the curve thinking, how do we use that data effectively? So one of the things we found is that many people are not very good at looking at spreadsheets and cells and cells of data. So we think the most effective way to use data is looking at it in a trend line. So we have a trend line, in this case, the history, if this is the drop, high school dropout rate, we can assume if we do nothing, it's just going to continue to go up. So we have a history and a forecast. And then we ask a simple question. Is that okay? If more kids drop out, is that okay? Of course, we say a resounding no, that's not okay. So what we want to do is turn the curve. So this is always about changing the trend. If it's going the wrong way, turning it the right, the right way. If it's going the right way, accelerating it. So it's always about turning the curve. So to do that, we then need to brainstorm, look at the trend line, and then brainstorm with a group, whether that's staff at a meeting or a coalition or your collective impact, partners around the table, look at the trend line and disaggregate the data so we know the true story, so we're very clear, but then identify what are the factors pushing up the uh, trend and what are the factors pushing tr down the trend. So we wanna brainstorm, why are kids dropping out of school? What are all the reasons they're dropping out of school? But we also wanna discuss what are all the reasons why kids are staying in school? So we're looking, because it's often easier to focus on what's working rather than trying to fix what's broken. So once we've brainstormed all of the factors that are contributing, and we might decide we need to talk to clients and do surveys and do all those things, but once we have a good sense of what are the factors are, then we wanna prioritize the top three to five factors that we're gonna work on as part of our effort now. And so once you have that, then the next question is, who are our partners that have a role to play in improving the trend? So we're gonna brainstorm governmental entities, other funders, community partners, the business community, the faith community, et cetera. When we do this, we wanna make sure that we are being as specific as possible, not just say the business community. What, what company, what CEO do we wanna involve? For say the faith community, what church, what pastor? Because we wanna move from talk to action. And if you're not specific, you have to have a whole nother meeting to unpack that. And, more, and you always have to include, and what are the, again, back to ABCD, this is where they come together, RBA and ABCD. What are the role of neighbors and families? Who can we involve in doing this? So once we brainstorm, and the reason we ask this question here before jumping to what works is because we want to broaden people's solution space, get them think outside the square. If we just jump right from what are the factors to what works, we'll stay on our own box of what we do. And one of the key components that we know is so critical about collective impact is broadening the circle. So once we have the factors, the partners that can help address those factors. Then we just talk about what works, literally brainstorming all the things we could do with those partners to address those factors. Certainly starting with evidence-based practices, promising practices, multifaceted approaches, policy changes, but we also wanna 
to do what we call low cost, no cost. What can we do without a new grant, without money, just acting differently? And as at the United Way over the years, I realized we never started any initiative about new money. It was never about getting a grant to do something. We always started at the low cost, no cost side. What can we do with what we already have to start this initiative? And this is also where you have that robust discussion about what are the role of clients and community residents, the co-production piece. You wanna make sure that you've clearly discussed that um, effectively. And then we move to the action plan. And when we move to the action plan, when we're doing it with indicators, we're coming up with new strategies or activities to implement. When we're doing it with performance measures, we're coming up with action plans around who, what, or when. Who's gonna be responsible to do it by when? So if, more, if, if we're doing this class and too many people are dropping out and we decide part of the problem is we don't provide food, at that staff meeting we come up with who's gonna be responsible for going and getting donations of food or paying for food so we can have food next week. Literally, who's gonna do it by when? And that's how we end our meeting. So population versus performance. So how does this all fit together? So it starts with, again, as I highlighted, a result and indicator. We do turn the curve thinking to identify the strategies, the programs, the policy changes, the activities we want to implement as a collective impact effort. This is population accountability. And then we move all of those up here and we develop pro programs or strategies, but most importantly, we develop performance measures around how much, how well and better off around all of the activities that we're implementing. And then we do turn the curve thinking to come up with action steps that we can actually do. And action steps literally are, what are we gonna do? Who's gonna be responsible for doing it by when? So that we can move from talk to action. The other way to think about it Here we go, sorry, looks like I do one of, there. So one last thing around this, being very clear that when we do this work around results and indicators and all of our programs and activities, be very clear that it takes many aligned programs or activities to turn a curve at a population level. No one agency, no one magic bullet. So it takes many aligned programs and strategies. So what we want to focus on, and this is where collective impact is so important, is what are, how are folks being very clear about their contributory relationship, not cause and effect. You cannot prove that any one program or activity turns a curve at a population level. You can only prove cause, a contributory relationship through an alignment of measures and appropriate responsibilities so that we're very clear that people are engaged and agencies are engaged and doing what they're supposed to do. And if we all do that collectively, we do have a chance of turning the curve at the population level. The next one. Oh. So let me uh, stop there and, uh, before, and uh, see if there are any uh, questions. Um, so we, uh, so far we've had two um, questions in, in the box. So if you guys want to start sending in your questions, um, one of the questions is about um, integrating, <clears throat> how to integrate ABCD and RBA for collective impact. And I think that this is really truly another session um, about putting it all together and um, when I, when that came in, I thought, wow, I'd love to share my story of how I've used all three of them to develop healthy community plans. Um, and I'm sure Dan, you have some, some stories too, yep. of how this has all been done. Yes. So I think the, uh, I mean, the, the key of integrating this is first of all, um, being very clear that the collective impact effort is a relay race and that we need the community as equal partners, the residents, the people we serve. We have to really view the people we serve never as just clients, never as just patients, but as co-producers of this effort. And kind of a, let me tell you a, a quick story out of Mike, uh, Mike Mather's book. They had a uh, soup kitchen 
And what they identified was people would come to the soup kitchen to, or to their food pantry to get food, and they would be looking pretty sad, and they'd give them the food, and they'd still walk out sad, because they were still just defined as needy people, hungry people. So they decided to do something different. When people came to uh, the, the food pantries and they gave them food, they also asked them, so what do you know about? You'd be willing to teach to somebody. What do you mean? Well, aren't there some things you know about? Yeah, I know about this. Well, if you, would, if you can find three people that you could bring back to the church that you want to teach them your skill, we'll give you a room to do that and we'll pay you to do it. And all of a sudden the people coming to the soup kitchen began to see themselves beyond just needy, hungry people, but people that did have gifts and skills. So that's uh, one of the ways to do that. Um, as we move forward is being very clear up front that we need to lead with the relay race in the work we're doing. And at the same time, provide that accountability um, and do the things to make sure that we're looking at the right data so we can make those decisions. And that's why those two fit together. But as I highlighted, even using RBA, um, when you talk about partners, you're always going to talk about the role of residents of the community. And when you do what works, you're always going to talk about what role can they play and how do we remove barriers so they can become part of the solution. So, so it starts with developing some key principles around this to guide your work that says people are always viewed as equals, as participants, as co-producers. Because if you start to go down a road, you might say, uh oh, we better not go down that road because we're violating that principle around this work. So I think it's really helpful to, um, to do that. Mm -hmm. So the questions are starting to pile in here, and I don't think we're going to be able to get to them all. One of them is asking you to go back to the turn the curve PowerPoint slide. Okay. And I, all right. I think I can do that. Um, and while you're, while you're doing that, um, and this, I was sort of thinking about, you know, how this all fits together and what I did. And, and I find that the, the two frameworks, results-based accountability and the collective impact framework, um, really where where one where one is I, where one is maybe lacking in an area, the other one gives you an idea and support on how to do it. Like they really complement each other, and they always say never put one egg like all your eggs in one basket. So using these two frameworks, I was able to really deepen and and try new ways of doing this work. Um, so an ex example would be where the, t like the turn the curve thinking, which I absolutely loved the turn the curve because it allowed everyone to participate. I'm not a data junkie. I don't know data. It actually scares me. So when you do that, you know, that projection and you get rid of the standard deviations and all that stuff, it really makes it it makes everybody on the same page and it, it's a, and a, and a fair decision-making process when you're pulling all these different people together. Yep, absolutely. And one of the things that we have to help do that, just let you know, Clear Impact, um, as you know, where I'm a senior consultant, we have software that support this called the Clear Impact Scorecard. You can go check that out online. Um, if you're interested at our website, clearimpact.com, you can actually get a free version for life that you can use in your effort. But the, what that allows you to do is put the turn the curve thinking exercise in the trend line up on the wall at a meeting, do the typing in the, in the notes on the scorecard. So, and literally at the end of the meeting, you've got all your notes, you've come up with your decisions, click a button, creates a PDF of it, you sell, send to everybody, you've done the minutes and you're moving effectively. So it really allows you to more effectively tell the story. And that's, it's a good strategy also for engaging the community because you can share all that on your website which then leads to the collective impact condition of constant communication. Exactly right. Well, right. you know, as we get to the, uh, the end here in a few minutes, what I'm thinking is I love some of the questions yeah. and they're really kind of deep. And I think what I certainly would be glad to do is if folks are interested in that we can schedule in the near future, mm -hmm. a, another webinar <laughs> around this just to focus on questions. So if we could have folks, um, maybe even you, could, you can set up a process for folks to even send in other questions and we'll identify the key questions that we could talk about in a webinar. Um, I would love to do that. And uh, also I think folks can contact me if they're interested in, in any dialogue. I think I can find here back to, uh, I think this is where we say, ignore the man behind the curtain for a second. <laughs> 
<laughs> while you're doing that though we we will be sending out a post email and we'll make okay. sure your contact information is there too All right. they can take a picture of this page as well so yeah. that, that has that information also wanted to highlight if folks do want more information about RBA, they can go to clearimpact.com and resources and you can order Mark's book. You can, actually you can actually download a two and a half hour video and watch a video of Mark talking about RBA and the guide. And here are some resources about asset-based community development. There's the ABCD Institute's website, ABCD in Action, which is an online Ning, or not a Ning anymore, it's an online communi community around this work. Uh, the Abundant Community, Peter Block and uh, John McKnight's work has one. And you can also download some of my information from our site as well. So yeah. there are plenty of resources out there, as well as the rich array of resources Tamarack has. Yeah, I was just going to, I was going <laughs> to pipe in there and say, for those Canadians on the call, but anybody, uh, we do have an ABCD um, Canada website too, uh, which really crosses over the ABCD Institute and it just reinforces and relinks to these, these uh, resources here. Um, so Glenda, can we go to the, the last few slides? Uh, just to, to wrap up, thank you so much, Dan. Um, as you can see, I'm very fired up about this. I love it. I love, you know, putting approaches together and working with community in a very, in a simple way. The work's not simple, but trying to make it really simple to, to work with the community, I think, is the key. And um, I've got some lots of aha moments. And again, I wish I did this 15 years ago because I think it would have made my, my work and my life easier. Um, so I, I think it's a great idea. We will, in a post email, I'll send you a link for you to sign up for a dive deeper uh, question and answer period uh, for this. And please keep putting your questions in there because I will save them and we will bring them back up on this conversation probably in a couple of weeks. Uh, I'm going to get you to send me some dates you're available, Dan, and we'll, we'll get that all organized. Um, and to stay in touch, we have these amazing newsletters. And I'm not just saying that because um, I put them together. Um, but it's a great way if you're working in cities deepening community or if you're working on in reducing poverty, these newsletters help capture what's happening across Canada, the resources, the tools, the stories. Um, it, and it's an opportunity for you to contribute and share your story. And so you can access this at um, our Tamarack website, www.tamarackcommunity.ca. And then we also have another amazing opportunity, which is a membership. And um, there's a Cities Reducing Poverty membership that's been um, happening for a couple of years. And we just launched the Cities Deepening Community membership. And um, it's a great way to, to um, connect with your peers across Canada, be part of a national movement, uh, learn the resources and tools that others are already doing, uh, and get support from Tamarack through coaching and um, other resources to help you develop neighborhood or poverty strategies. And again, you can go to our website to get that more information on that, or you can email me, heather at tamarackcommunity.ca, and I can direct you into the right, uh, the right area. And in a few days, you will receive, oh, sorry, we actually have some other learning opportunities too. Um, a webinar on practical lessons for community leaders. And um, this is actually a really good one, authentically advancing um, racial equity. It's an up and coming topic. Lots of people are talking about this. And you can get, again, go to our website. We have lots of learning opportunities. They pop up every month webinars, um, um, podcasts, etc. So if you don't have Tamarack in your favorites, um, I would suggest that you do. And um, in a few days, you'll receive a follow-up email. Uh, we will include the PowerPoint and the recording and also another link for you to sign up for a dive deeper into questions and answers. And if you have any questions or comments, please email me. We always are trying to improve ourselves in these webinars. If you have a suggestion or a topic that you'd like us to do, uh, let me know. And um, that is it for us. Thank you again, Dan. Thank you all for taking the time out of your day to, to, to learn and have a great afternoon. Yes, thank thank you. you all very much. And thank you, Heather. You're welcome.